それでは時間となりましたので本日のホール B 最後のセッションとなる日本企業が注目する英国スタートアップ紹介セッションを開始いたします。このセッションは2つのパートに分かれています。前半はヘイドドル社と日本のヤマトホールと言います。続いてのトホールは、エンドセカンドマインド社と日本のマツダ。And Mazda from Japan. So we'll be focusing on these two Japan UK partnerships. My name is Shibayama from UK, acting as the facilitator for the entire part and as the MC for the first half. So now would、we'll、like to start the session. On the business strategy of Dodo and Yamato Holdings in the Japanese market, the speakers are Mr. Tim Robinson, CEO of Dodo Parcel Services Limited. Mr. Robinson will be using Zoom. And from the venue here, we have Mr. Yasuhiro Saito, Senior Manager of Yamato Holdings, and concurrently the Senior Vice President of EC Division Yamato Transport. First, Mr. Robinson, CEO, will be presenting on Dodo's business strategy in the Japanese market driven by cooperation with Yamato Holdings. Mr. Robinson, could you please start? Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at、uh, the conference here today.、Um, so, firstly, who are Dodo?、Um, And first slide, please.、Um, so, Doddler, a UK technology business.、Um, we're global、uh, and we're looking to change the way that consumers receive and return online shopping.、Uh, our business has been uh, uh, formed in 2014, so we're nearly seven years old.、Uh, and the business was founded by myself and Sir Lloyd Dorfman, the famous、uh, and well respected British entrepreneur. I can't actually see my slides on my screen. If somebody could get my slides up, that would be great. Thank you. So, why is Doddle interested in Japan? Well, Japan is the fourth largest e commerce market in the world, and it's a market which is growing extremely quickly.、Uh, to support our interest, Japanese consumers are Uh, well versed at adopting new technologies, new systems, new services. And this is a retail market with lots of, lots of large brands, global brands, are active both in physical retail and online, as well as a market which is significantly supported by、uh, multiple marketplace businesses, you know, Rakuten, Amazon being classic examples. So, huge demand for e commerce, which is growing day by day. Next slide, please. Japan has some unique delivery characteristics. So, all of this volume that I've just talked about, you know, this growing demand from consumers, 99% of outbound e commerce deliveries in Japan are delivered to people's homes. And to give you some perspective on that,、uh, in the UK, 85% of deliveries are delivered to home. The rest go to what we call out of home delivery locations.、Uh, in France, that number is 60%. You know, very mature network of pickup points,、uh, automated lockers, and consumers have adopted those services en masse. And in Sweden, that's 35%. You know, home delivery is a premium service, it's the unexpected of consumers. So here in Japan, with 99% of deliveries going to home, there's a huge opportunity to make that shift in consumer behavior. You know, why is that important? Well, in Japan, there's a very high first time failed delivery rate. You know, somewhere between 15 and 20%. You know, compare that to the UK, where only 4% of, del of deliveries are failed first time. Huge impact on networks, huge impact on the customer experience. There are capacity challenges. As with, as with most of the globe, these, these challenges are、uh, magnified in Japan, particularly in the big cities, where there's a very high proportion of urban dwellings, people living in, in urban environments. And there is a reducing、uh, workforce, you know, number of drivers, people to work in, in sortation systems and sortation offices. So those capacity challenges are increasing. There's a concentration of that capacity across just three major carriers, but all of the three major carriers have, have large scale operations delivering 
uh, many millions of parcels a year. But it means it's a very competitive market, which doesn't help from a capacity uh, overview. And I think that, that the Amazon symbol there uh, is very symptomatic of the, of the challenge, but the opportunity in the Japanese e-commerce market. You know, we've seen around the world that wherever Amazon go, uh, they start to increase greater com uh, consumer expectations. Uh, they create you know, the best delivery experiences and they give access to premium delivery services. Um, and that, that raises expectations and everybody else has to raise their game. Next slide, please. So, you know, how did we find Yamato and how did Yamato find us? Well, it's quite a rare and unique story in the world of global uh, parcel carriers because parcel carriers are typically more traditional, not particularly innovative, um, often have a kind of build technology in-house mentality. So there, there aren't many circumstances where a large carrier that is, that is significant in their market has looked to the outside world for new ideas and new opportunities. We actually met, uh, ironically, in the United States, where Doddle was part of the Plug and Play Technology Accelerator program, and Yamato are one of the major investors in that program, you know, kind of highlighting just how, how much of a drive for entrepreneurialism and innovation there is within the team in Yamato. And very quickly, we found Yamato to be extremely progressive, um, I'd say innovative on a large scale, which a business of their size and shape requires. Um, but I would also say hungry for digital transformation. You know, they weren't just talking about it. They were spending millions and millions of yen looking to change the way their business operates. And Saito Sam will talk a bit more about that uh, later. And having, having carried out a number of face-to-face -face meetings, both in the US, London, and, uh, and in Tokyo, you know, we very quickly found that we had a shared vision for how delivery could evolve over time and that our business's culture were very much aligned, which says a lot about a large corporation that they could have a cultural fit with a small kind of emerging technology business on the other side of the world. Next slide, please. And so what are we doing in this space? Well, um, we're helping Yamato to drive systematic behavioral change in the way that consumers receive and return their online shopping. You know, Yamato already have uh, a large number, hundreds of thousands of relationships with, uh, with parcel shops you know, with independent businesses, large chains, um, uh, businesses carrying out lots of different business functions that act as agents for Yamato in the community. That could be a convenience store, a rice shop, a supermarket, all different shapes and sizes. What we're doing is digitizing that whole relationship and that whole process to make sure that consumers can see all those delivery options at every, every online checkout that they shop at, that they can communicate with those parcel shops digitally uh, and they can understand all of the characteristics of that service and that network uh, uh, from their mobile phone, from you know, that, that device that, that ultimately runs and leads their life. You know, what else does it do? Well, it significantly improves that first time delivery rate. If we collectively can drive consumers to choose parcel pickup rather than home delivery, we will increase the, the first time delivery rate and, and, you know, and, and help the capacity challenge. Um, we will ultimately drive footfall into Yamato's partner shop network. You know, this is why these partners see Yamato as such an important part of their, uh, their world. It's another reason to get consumers into their store, regardless of what that store's core competency is, providing great service, you know, un, you know, in line with a very recognizable brand, the Black Cat brand. And as time goes on, we'll start to see uh, the consumer demand for easy returns. You know, this is very much being driven by, uh, by the likes of Amazon, you know, who are driving in returns to be free, you know, the, the process to be super easy. The more locations you have where a consumer can drop a return back into a network, the greater that uh, experience. And the more digital it is, the more you don't need a parcel label, you can remove packaging and you can give what is the world leading uh, customer experience. Next slide, please. And as I've said, the key component of this really is around digitizing the way that the consumer engages with delivery services, both how they choose those delivery services and ultimately choose out of home delivery, delivery to, a, to a, a parcel shop, make that digital, put it on the checkout at the point at which the consumer is making their ultimate buying choice, you know, give them constant uh, tracking information so they understand where their order is or understand at what point their return is in the supply chain, when their refund has been uh, has been uh, promoted. 
a really kind of put moving moving parcel delivery into a wholly digital end-to-end journey, just like Japanese consumers really now expect. And, and you know, how they've begun to become familiar with other services and other products in their day-to-day life, whether that's, you know, food delivery or whether it's how they consume other uh, important services like buying music, watching films, you know, and all the things which make up modern-day consumer life. And I think, you know, delivering a great customer experience is something that, that the Yamato have been known for for 100 years. You know, the quality of the frontline staff, you know, the white glove, high premium outdoor experience has been one of the things that's underpinned the brand over a very long period of time. As consumers become more digital, our challenge is to create a white glove uh, digital experience to rival that that can be uh, delivered at your, uh, at your front door. Next slide, please. And I think, um, you know, we've, for, a, for an, a UK based business, you know, trading with organizations on the other side of the world, we have different time zones and very, you know, different language, language and culture uh, can be very daunting. It can be scary. But, you know, in Yamato, we found a large corporate partner um, that, that embraces those cultural differences, sees that we can add experience from around the world. Uh, and you overlay that on their scale and their operational capability. And we're very excited about what we're building together today. Thank you. どうもありがとうございました。ロビンソン様。では、また後ほどよろしくお願いいたします。So, like、では、それでは今度は日本側、so、ということで、ヤマトホールディングス斉藤様、so、よろしくお願いいたします。So、Mr. Saito from Yamato Holding speaking.、はい、お願いします。じゃあ、スライドを。So I'd like to、um, show you our slide. Yamato Holdings, I'm Saito from Yamato Holdings. 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 あのヤマトはですね今年の1月にまあヤマトネクスト100というあの新しい戦略を打ち出しました。まあその中の一つがですね EC エコシステムの確立ということで、こちらに挙げている3つの要素ですね。新たに EC 向けの配送サービスを導入、あと EC 事業者購入者それぞれにですね最適な送り方受け取り方を構築。であとは自発地を含めたさまざまなその上流の工程と言われるまあラストアンマル以外のところにサービスを提供します。まあこういったものを作りたいということでヤマト。What we want to create, and that's why we came up with the strategy. So, the second and third is something that we have been able to. The reason why we decided to partner with Yamato. So, when you put this in a diagram, the left hand side, the larger mid side, is companies. They go through our terminal and go to the last one mile delivery. And on the very right hand side, to the consumers, we always look at their perspective for them. So, various parcels we provide to the consumers. And、here we have based on the new digital transformation, we want to provide a new delivery system. And as we can hear, whether it is smart lock and in other areas, we are able to receive parcels and also return goods. So the delivery has changed for the growth of e-commerce. We must also align with that. And under such situations, e-commerce and e-transformation is important. So in terms of delivery in June of this year, we started to use a product. This is a way of delivering, and this is for operators. And the characteristic of this is that whilst we do put focus in that we leave the luggage at the front of the client, but until the client consumers receive the luggage, they can change where they want their luggage to be delivered at real time through being connected with the client on real time. 
サービスだったり会員サービスがあったんですがどうしてもその時間のタイムラグがあったんですねでそれを我々新しいデジタルを使うことによって本当に受け取る直前まで例えば家の前に置いておいてほしいであったりとか店舗で受け取りたいとかあとは対面で受け取りたいとかそういったニーズを叶える定商品としてこの技術というのをリリースしました例えばこれからご飯を作るとかお風呂に入るとか今ちょっと勉強に集中したいというときは機械のボタンを押せばお使いになりますしまあ、また、例えばすぐ出かけて帰ってきて、置き換えボタンを押してたんですけど、対面で受け取りたいというときは対面に変更できる。まあ、そういったあのお客様ですね、動きに、えー、その時に、えー、商品ということで出してきました。これを実現したのが一番大きなやはりデジタルの分野です。で、デジタルの分野のサービスを生かしていきたいというところでですね、ドルシャソンを提供していきたいというところで、我々あの輸送商品だけではなくてですね、新しくその e コマースの荷物を配達する専用の配達員の方々をパートナーとして今契約をしております。あのこれはセールスドライバーと呼ばれるですね、街中を駆け回ってくれている第一線のドライバーさんではなくてですね。まあ、新しく中小の運送事業者様たちをパートナーとしてですね、我々はマネジメントしていくと、そういった形で組織をしていきます。で、この方々が先ほど EG を中心とした e コマースの今後の新しい担い手になっていくということで、我々は設計をしております。まあ、この分野、よくギグワーカーという言葉も出ますが、今は事業者の方々に参加させていただいてますが、ゆくゆくは地域の配達やですね、地域の物流というものを新しく作っていきまして、まあそこの核となる配達のパートナーということで位置づけております。でまあ、ここにいろんなテクノロジーのことが書いてあるんですが、まあ、我々、あのやはりデジタルを基盤に今後、高い事情を変えたいと思っております。まあ、今までアナログのフェイストゥーフェイスのコミュニケーションがやはり宅急便ですと言っていたりしますが、このコミュニケーションはこれからもずっと変わらないんですね。それに加えて、e コマース市場という新たな市場に対して、さまざ、あ、まな、えー、お客様への価値を提供していくということを今後進めていきたいと思います。でその中でなぜドドルズとですね、提供したかったと,というところですが、こちらのパートナーシップ締結前のサービスリリース、11月予定をしておりますが、まあ、そこまでの流れになっております。あの我々よく大企業はですね、スピードが遅いと。ベンチャーの方々に比べて組むスピードも考えるスピードも遅いと言われているんですが今回我々の社長直下でですね意思決定を迅速したのとあと権限維持をされてましたので我々のサービスを作る人間がですね本当に必要なパートナーであったりとか本当にそのサービスさんの迅速に意思決定をしてサービス構築をしていきました左側からありますがなぜドドロやはりあの彼らの持つですね圧倒的なノウハウとやはり UK オーストラリア、USA ですねまあ、やはりあのお互いの利益とかですね、そういったことではなくて、やはり社会に対して何を提供するかというところをですね、我々主眼に置いて議論をしていったので、まあ、そのためにはどういう契約の形態であったりとか、どういうサービスを提供すればいいのか、まあ、これを徹底的に話して進めていきました。で、最終的に何を実現するのかというところですが、まあ、ティムも説明をしてくれましたが、まあ、お客様がですね、あの先ほど言ったイージーを提供することによって、まあ、リアルタイムに自分の行動に伴って宅配を受けることができる。つまりどういうことかというと自宅でないところでも受け取れるというところに価値を見いだしたいと思っています。まあ、それはすなわちですね、まあ、皆さんが会社に行かれたり、学校に行かれたりする中で,です、ね、自分の動線で必要なものを必要なところに受け取れる、そういった世界を作りたいと思ってまして、その基盤となる、叶えるものがデジタルであって、その中核を担っていただけるのがドドロのサービスだと思っております。まあ、具体的には我々、ストアと呼ばれるですね、まあ、今まで宅急便のですね取り次ぎをしていただいてたパートナーショップがですね、えー、大多数、えー、パートナーショップをしておりますのでそこの方々を中心に、まあ、ドドロのアプリケーションの端末を配慮しまして、まあ、そこで受け取れるような仕組みを作ってまいりますで受け取った後もですね返品ですねこれも日本だとなかなか市場が作れてないんですがこの返品市場というのも作っていきたいと思っておりますでこの、えー、我々の提供するサービスのコア技術をまあドドルにお願いするというところがまず今回のサービスの重要な場面になってきていると思います。
まあ、そのようなですねあの我々がまあデジタル化社会とですね増加していく EEC 市場に対して、どっちかというとパートナーシップをですね組むことによってまあこのような価値をですねお客様に提供していきたいと。そのように考えて、簡単ですが以上です。So that was brief, but thank you very much. 斉藤様どうもありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Mr. Saito. ではですねここからえっとティム様。So, from here, I would like Ms. Tim and Saito san, I would like to ask a couple of questions. So, first, to Tim, so Dodo, prior to partnership with Yamato,、uh, with Amazon and US Post, have already、um, implemented、um, services of yours. So, at these companies, what kind of、um, significant effect, what kind of merit they, do they have? We don't know that in Japan. So, if you could briefly explain what kind of significant effect. There was. Yes, thank you. Yes, as I said in the, my earlier presentation, we,、uh, we've been working with、um, Australia Post, Amazon, USPS, among others, for some time now. I think Australia is a really good example where、um, before we, we entered into our partnership, there was relatively low level of、uh, out of home delivery adoption from consumers, even though Australia Post had a network of 4,000 post offices. Those post offices weren't really digitally enabled. And we've done two things. We have,、uh, we have created, we've doubled the size of the network. So now Australia Post uh, uh, customers can access not just the post offices, but a、uh, network of supermarkets, convenience stores,、uh, dry cleaners, pharmacies. So there are more choices to consumers. And we've, we've integrated those out of home delivery solutions,、uh, parcel pickup solutions. At the checkout of more than 300、uh, Australian retailers, driving both collections and returns. So, you know, there's been a big shift in that in terms of overall volume. In the short term, we've driven about a 3% increase in out of home delivery.、Uh, ours and Australia Post forecast is in a non COVID year, we would, we would have seen about a 5% uh, increase in out of home delivery. And we're forecasting a 10% shift from home to parcel shop. Uh, by 2025, that midpoint in our license arrangement. Our relationship with Amazon was, was very different. Our relationship with Amazon is around improving the customer experience and of, of e commerce returns. The core product change we made with Amazon was initially in the UK, where we introduced a service that allowed consumers to return items to Amazon without having to repackage them. So you could return an iPhone just in the Apple iPhone box. Um, and in doing so, across, across our UK network, we saw a 100% increase in volume overnight. You know, that's such a popular service for consumers that Amazon are now adopting that service around the globe and seeing similar levels of adoption. So I think it's, you know, this is all about digitization. If we digitize in the right way, we will see consumers change their behavior because it's how their lives now operate. Thank you very much. そのような技術を日本にも導入していくと、そういうことですね。で、それでは、えっと、斉藤さんの方にも聞きたいと思うんですが、えっと、まあ、私も含め、普通の、まあ、あとおそらく、この。配信を見ている方々、みんなヤマトのお客様だと思います。例えば、ドドロとの提携で、このお客様の体験、どんな風に具体的に変わっていくのか。そのあたりのところをちょっと説明していただけますか。はい。あのまあ、今回、ドドル社と提携することによって、まあ、実現できるサービスはさまざまなところで受け取れるというサービスですが、まあ、今までですと、どうしても自宅の宅配、まあ、先ほど、まあ、ティムの数字にもありましたが、99% は家で送られるお客様が多いので、やはり我々がお客様の行動を妨げてはいけない、そういったところもございますので、このドドルのサービスを提供させていただくことで、まあ、先ほどのイージーというそのリアルタイムなコミュニケーションをお客様と取れるようになった上で、どこでも受け取れるというところにスマホを進んでいきますので、先ほど申しましたが、例えば自分の行動の動線ですね、あの自分がどこかに行く途中で受け取りたいとか、どこかに行くときの必要なものを途中で受け取りたいという形で、まあ、あの世の中にあるあらゆる店舗で受け取れるようになって、利便性が上がるという世界を我々は。わかりました。先ほどのですね、本当に。うんまああの 99% まあおそらくこの見ている皆さんも基本的には自宅で受け取れると思ってますけど、今度のこのサービスで,ですねあのつまりまあ私も含めて基本的に自宅に送ってもらってるんですけど、お客さんが自宅で受け取る
というのが、まあ、それが基本だと考えていれば、顧客以外でも受け取るけど、やっぱり自宅がいいよって人がいるとすれば、お客のマインドを変えなきゃいけないと、例えば本当にこの宅配のですね自宅配達率を下げるために、いいぐらい用意したけど、お客の,その要望というか、自宅以外でやりたいとそのための戦略って例えばどういうものがあるんでしょうか、はい、あのそこは非常にです、ね、おっしゃるとおりなかなかマインドを変えるというのは難しいと思うんですが、まあ、今までそう宅配でそういうのを変えるというのが一番お客様にとってストレスだったところとあとその待って、まあ、家でも置き配とかですねそういった手段はあるんですけど、まあ、我々の今回ですねあのマインドを変えていくというところではやはりその受け取られるお客様の、えー、自分の行動の中で使えるものであったり必要なものっていうのは必要な時に受け取れるような形を作っていきたいです。例えば今までですと明日使うものを今日中に宅配してほしいとかいうことだったんですけど例えばこれからドドロのサービスを使ってさらに我々先ほど言ったパートナーショップの方々と連携してさまざまな形を今後提供していきたいと思いますのでそれと柔軟な配送のネットワークかつデジタルにつながっているところが合わさると思います、ね。自分が今すぐ使うものもこれから出かける途中に受け取りながらえー、客先に行けたり、自分の友達、友人の家だったりとか、家に行ける例えば、この時間からも頼んで、帰りがけにどこかの店でも、えー、受け取って、どこかに行くと。そういうあのタッチポイントとしてのまあ場所をですね我々文化として変えていきたいのでやはり行動に即した受け取り場所というのを今後は提唱していくとそのためにはスピード配送だったりとかまたはえオンラインでお客様とコミュニケーションを取れるとかですねその今までの待ってお客様にあの能動的ではなくてまああの我々どんどんどんどん動かしていきたいと思います。分かりました、まあ、確かにお客さんもですねいろんな形で動くので、その動線上と、まあ、ただ荷物の重い場合はちょっと嫌だなと思ったりもしますけど、まあ、その点も含めてです、ね、どんなふうに変わるのかということを、えー、期待したいと思います。えー、そしてですねもう一回、えー、キム様聞きたいんですけど、先ほどの、ね、プレゼンテーションの中にですね、えーヤマトと何をするのかという中に統合的なデータとヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、ヤマト、What's the meaning behind、uh, integrating data capturing and how that's going to help or change things in the future? Yeah, a, a good example、um, of how we are using data more and more effectively、uh, across our products is around returns, e commerce returns. You know, but part of the e commerce challenge, particularly around fashion, for example,、uh, is the inability to try on、uh, a garment in a shop. You know, consumers want to shop more, they want more choices, they want to be able to try different colors, different sizes, different shapes. But there is a, there is a need to understand、uh, that, that modern consumers, therefore, need to have a way of, of, of understanding what's right for them, what products are right for them, what services are right for them. Doddle's returns platform captures data about why a specific consumer. Would return a different type of item, you know, whether that was shoes, clothing, electronics. And we can start to learn about that consumer, which can help a retailer, you know, Yamato's clients. We're hoping that collectively we and Yamato will be able to provide retailers with some really rich data about there's a particular product here that is often being returned because it's the wrong size. There's something about that product that needs to be reviewed. Or, you know, there is a particular,、um, there's a particular issue with a, a, an electronic item. Which is creating a large number of returns. You know, it's building inefficiency and cost into the system. You know, there must be something in this that's worth you having a look at to see whether, we could, whether there's some product changes you can make or take that product off sale until such time as it's more reliable.、Um, but I think ultimately, this is all about, you know, the data space for us is all about consumer preferences. And all consumers have preferences about what they buy, how they buy, you know, what payment engine they use to buy. Um, their favorite website, their favorite marketplace. Consumers also have similar preferences around delivery. And the more we can learn about why a consumer makes that delivery choice for that product, the more we can tailor、uh, the digital journey for consumers going forward. You know, and you made a good point earlier on about you know, if something's large and heavy, it's unlikely that I'm going to want to pick that up in a, in a partner shop.
And that's absolutely right. You know, parcel pickup, partner shops won't be right for every consumer all of the time. But the more we can learn their trends and their habits and the, 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 the platforms that they shop in where they choose pick up, the platforms they shop in where they choose home delivery, I think we'll be able to create a very seamless experience for consumers in the future. They won't have to choose every time because we'll be able to we'll be providing the choices for them. わかりました。まあ本当にその形でですね、ヤマトさんの方もいろんな形のデータ習得することでですね、新しい方向、トレンド、そういうものにつながるかと思います。えっとちょうど時間となってしまいましたので、どうもティム様、そして斉藤様、ありがとうございました。ではこれで前半のセッションを終わりたいと思います。では後半のセッションに入る前に、ちょっと後半のセッションメンバーが変わりますので、しばらく準備をいたします。このまま画面を変えてください。Before we go into the second session, the members will have to be replaced, so we need some time for preparation. We will start once we are ready. Thank you. 井上さん、こちらの声聞こえるでしょうか。井上さん、can you hear hear me? 井上さん、こちらの声聞こえるでしょうか。井上さん、can you hear me？ あ、はい。はい。えー、では次のセカンドセッション、えー、始めたいと思います。So we'd like to start the second session。えー、セカンドマインドと日本のマツダとの協力についてです。It is about the partnership between Second Mind of UK and Mazda from Japan. The MC is Mr. Tomohiro Inoue, business development consultant of Second Mind and country manager for Angus Cybersecurity. So now passing the microphone to Mr. Inoue, and we'd like to ask Inoue-san to introduce the speakers as well. Shibayama-san, thank you for the introduction. I have Inoue from Second Mind. We Second Mind is、uh, AI venture at Cambridge. So, in the、uh, machine learning and Gauss, we would like to apply that to resolve the practical issues. So, to simplify, Normal AIs, the AI cannot be utilized unless the same trend of data has been largely collected. But when you use this, even with、uh, decentralized data or less data, it is possible to do the processing in a fast speed. So this time, Mazda, our car manufacturer, by using the decision engine of Second Mind. ICE parameters and the manworks have been significantly reduced. So this is the case, and、um, Richard Chatlas will be explaining about this.、Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tomo. Uh, my name is Vishal Chatlas. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Second Mind.、Uh, firstly, a very Uh, good evening to you, and I would like to apologize for not being able to be there in Japan in purpose, uh, uh, in, per in person. Sorry,、uh, as people、uh, do know that I'm deeply passionate both about Japan and automotive, and so it was especially sad to be not to be there at this event.、Uh, at Second Mind, we are a Cambridge-based、uh, company. We started in 2016, and、uh, Our core focus is building our decision engine that helps us or helps organizations to make better decisions、uh, at an organizational level, but also helps the people inside the organizations、uh, make better decisions. We are operating in the supply chain industry right now, and also in the automotive industry.、Uh, we have always focused on building the core tech、uh, around our technology, and till date. We have published 65 peer-reviewed papers and filed 18 patents, of which one we have been granted recently. The focus of my talk will be on the automotive side today.、Uh, we can all agree、uh, in this session today that 2020 has not been a fantastic year、uh, for the world, and especially so. Uh, for the automotive industry, and so I hope that by the end of my presentation today, I will be able to share something positive about the technology we are developing that gives all of us a positive feeling or a more positive feeling about the future of the automotive industry. 
Now, uh, AI and machine learning has been something that has been talked about quite a bit over the last few years in the automotive industry. But primarily, the areas where it's been talked about have been autonomous driving or voice recognition systems. Where AI has not been uh, talked about or been applied uh, so well as it should have been applied are what I would describe as the more bread and butter issues in the automotive industry, like uh, the engine calibration, like transmission calibration, like applying it to the body control. Uh, the focus of the talk today would be around how Second Mind has been applying AI in the area of uh, engine calibration and how we are transforming how that process is done. And at this point, I would also like to thank uh, our strategic partner, Mazda, in the work that they have uh, done with us. Before I move any further, I would like to highlight some of the key challenges in the automotive industry. And these are, all, these are not new to anybody from the industry. Uh, we all know that as the industry is moving towards electrification, towards hybridization, towards uh, a different kind of powertrains like hydrogen, there is an increasing need for the industry and the OEMs to support more and more powertrains. At least I don't remember uh, any time in my career or in my life where we had such a wide variety of engines available from any car manufacturer. The other thing that we are seeing is that the powertrains are getting exponentially more complex. And that complexity is being driven by the ever tightening emission standards, which are of course being tightened for all the right reasons. But the effect of this is that the development times are getting longer and the costs are spiraling. In the face of the increasing costs, uh, we are also seeing that the OEMs are having to make a very difficult balancing act like never before. The demands on the OEMs are a lot. Uh, the consumers or the drivers want maximum efficiency. But at the same time, they also want maximum power and maximum torque. You know, that's what we enjoy as drivers. But at the same time, uh, drivers are getting more environmentally conscious. They want to have low CO2 emissions. And uh, there is no doubt we still want our engines to be very, very robust and last a long time. Of course, one of the uh, views of people who are not from the automotive industry is that, well, we have these challenges, but uh, these should be very easy to solve. Why don't we just all go electric? Let all cars become battery electric cars from tomorrow. But then from us in the industry, we know that, that that's not the reality. The reality is that even with the most optimistic estimates, we see that at least for the next 20 years, nearly half the cars sold will have some form of internal combustion engines. Of course, there'll be hybrids, uh, there'll be battery electric, and there'll be a mixture of other powertrains. Now, this is the reality that we have. So it is very important, uh, and we have to be very responsible to ensure that as long as the internal combustion engines are there, our job is to make sure the calibration is top notch so that we are able to maximize uh, the uh, trade-offs between good drivability and good fuel consumption. The other trend that we are seeing over the past uh, 10 to 15 years is that with the increase in complexity, the time that it takes to calibrate the uh, internal combustion engines is taking longer and longer. Uh, by some estimates, the time has now become uh, 10 times over the last 15 years increase. Now, of course, for certain engine types that are more complex, this time could be longer. For engine, for certain engine times that, uh, you know, this uh, kind of 10x could be shorter. But this is a good uh, benchmark uh, that we are seeing across the industry. And I'm sure uh, most of you will agree with this. With the tightening of the emission standards, there is a very real uh, cost 
or a financial burden that's on the OEM. Uh, there was a report published earlier this year from PA Consulting that highlighted the very steep financial impact of these regulations and of the failure of the uh, OEMs to not get their engines up to the standard. Again, I don't need to go into the details of this report. The numbers here speak for themselves. We at Second Mind, we understood the challenge and with our passion that we had for the automotive industry and our background and expertise in AI, we started to work with Mazda to see how we could use uh, the cooperation between the both companies to see if we could significantly reduce the time for optimization of ECU calibration and how we could save time, CapEx and OpEx, and most importantly, accelerate the time to market of newer technologies and cleaner engines. Before I go any further, I would like to briefly uh, review the engine calibration process uh, and explain how we fit into that process. The process today in terms of engine calibration has substantial amount of uh, manual work still. So there is automation and, and it is increasing, but still it is substantially manual. And a typical uh, process that we have in uh, engine calibration looks something like this. We start with an experimental design. There is some test bench, which we use for data acquisition. We do some modeling, we do some analysis, and then we go back to the test bench for recalibration. And this particular process could take six months, it could take 12 months, it could take 18 months, depending upon the engine type and how the exact process looks like. So the six months figure here is simply as as a benchmark. And beyond that, you can have an in-vehicle test that substantially adds to the value. So this is broadly uh, what I would describe as a typical process. And when we add the second mind decision engine to this process, so we are heading towards the direction where we see that we are reducing the total time of calibration in the process by about one third. So typically, if you're process was roughly six months long, we are uh, trending towards reducing that to two months. If it is 12 months, 18 months, of course, the difference would be larger. And a more important thing I would also like to say that this is also dependent upon the how complex the engine is. For certain engine types, it could be a bit longer. For certain engine times, it could be less. So what that means is, in certain cases, you, you might see a saving up to two thirds. In certain cases, you might see a saving of up to half. But in any case, uh, what we are seeing that when we start to use our decision engine for calibration, we are saving months. And I think that's the key thing here. The other key challenge that we put ourselves was that when we introduce our software platform, the second mind decision engine, as it's called, into the automotive process, it should be able to slide in absolutely seamlessly. So we did not want to cause any disruption in the existing processes. Because also from my own background in manufacturing, uh, I totally appreciate that it is very, very difficult and very, very disruptive to change the existing workflow of an OEM or a factory. So hence the goal was how could we build a solution or how could we build a product that slides in seamlessly. So therefore, the second mind decision engine is available through a REST API, which connects to an existing uh, test bench that an OEM may have. And using that test bench, we gather the data. Upon gathering the data, we build the models. And then the models are transferred back uh, to the uh, test bench where using some analysis environment uh, and tools like MATLAB or, or, or uh, equivalent tools, uh, we are able to build the right uh, tables, which are then used to program the engine ECU. So again, there could be a slight difference between the processes, between the manufacturers, but this is really representative of a fairly general process that we are seeing. Now, the question uh, that most of you will have that, okay, uh, Second Mind is making quite big claims. 
but how are we really getting the differences? What does the technology really do? And what kind of technology do we use? So at this point, I would like to look a bit more under the hood and talk about the technology. So the core uh, of our technology is really a combination of Bayesian optimization and using our core Gaussian process models that we have built proprietary to get these uh, effects. Now, Bayesian optimization to quite a few of you might already be familiar. It's been used for the past 10, 20 years uh, in the aerospace industry uh, for the calibration of, um, of engines. Uh, it's also been used for the design and optimization of the design of wings. Uh, some people in the automotive industry have also used it. Uh, so in this case, uh, we started with that and we improved upon it. So just to give a very concrete example, uh, let's imagine an optimization problem uh, where we are trying to maximize uh, fuel efficiency or we're trying to calibrate the engine towards fuel efficiency as quickly as possible. So in this situation, among the various uh, parameters that we have to optimize, for the sake of simplicity, we will look at only two dimensions. So on the y-axis, you see spark timing, and on the x-axis, you see fuel injection. Now, the goal is, as we head towards fuel efficiency, to find the optimal uh, area of fuel efficiency that we can operate under without going into the unsafe operating zones of the engine. So the red zone that you see there is the unsafe zone. The dark purple is the most optimal and safe zone. So you want to operate the engine at the edge, edge of efficiency without increasing the NOx so it becomes detrimental to the life of the engine. So that is always the challenge. And the goal is always that how fast you can achieve that optimum. Of course, when we start the process, we don't know what these regions are. We don't know what is the boundary between the purple and the red engine. So in the next slide, I will start from a blank sheet where you, you will not have the purple and the red and see how the process works. So in this uh, slide, let's start on the left-hand side. Uh, on the left-hand side, what you see is a two-dimensional uh, graph. You have spark timing and fuel injection again. And one of the naive or very simple ways to look for the boundary between low knock and high knock areas is to do a, a grid search, which essentially is you're trying to uh, do a scan across all the uh, points in the two dimensional space. And as you can imagine, this could take a very long time. And as we are going along, whenever you see a green dot, so that means you're operating in a safe environment or a low knock area. And as you keep scanning along, the moment you see a red dot, that indicates you're dealing with a high knock area. And right now, you will see a red dot. So now, if we go across this environment and we keep scanning, if you see below in the fuel efficiency time graph, you will see that the process is fairly slow at coming to the optima. And this, of course, this slowness increases as you get with higher dimensionality. Now, about 10, 20 years ago, uh, some very good engineers thought that they will use Bayesian optimization to speed up the process you know, to, or to improve the efficiency of the process. And what Bayesian optimization does is instead of doing this very naive uh, scanning of the two-dimensional space, you have certain models that allow you to predict the likelihood of the position where you will find the optima between the high knock and the low knock areas. So when you have the ability to predict, so you tend to scan the points where you have higher probability. So as you can see in the graph in the middle with Bayesian optimization, that there is a higher concentration of the red and green dots towards a narrower area, which gives you an indication where the boundary is. So the process is undoubtedly faster and more efficient than Bayesian optimization but we were still not satisfied with it. We, we still thought it was too slow. And hence, we started uh, working on the next generation Bayesian optimization, where we have used our proprietary Gaussian process models that give you that ability to do that search in a much, much faster and efficient way. And that leads to much further 
uh, efficiency and uh, time gains. And in the next slide, I will show you some results. Now, I've also brought back the purple and the red words. So that gives you an idea of uh, like the reference point. And when we did one particular experiment, we saw that with the grid search, if you look at the lower part of the graph of the lower side, the lower part of the slide, you will see that the time to optima for the grid search was 810 time units. With Bayesian optimization, it was faster. We got 75 time units. But with the next generation Bayesian optimization, which is our proprietary technology, we were able to get 11 time units, so substantially faster. However, these results are about a two-dimensional space. And a two-dimensional space, as I mentioned earlier, is not really representative of the actual engine environment because we are dealing with much more number of parameters and it is much more higher dimensional. So uh, when we look at an eight-dimensional space, if you go to the uh, upper end of the presentation, and if, when we run through a bunch of experiments, and an eight-dimensional space being probably closer to what you see in the real world. Again, for certain engines, it could be higher, some it could be lower. In an eight-dimensional space, we see a speed up up to 100 times of Bayesian optimization that is the current state of the art in the automotive industry. So it is substantially faster. Now, as the engines are getting more complex, if you have your optimization problem that is greater than eight dimensional, then the speed up will be more than 100 times. And if it is less than eight dimensional, it could be slow or, or it could be a bit lower. Now, again, these are representational figures based on an engine and on your process. It could be a bit higher, it could be a bit lower, but I wanted to give you the feeling of the substantial benefits that we bring to this process. Now, with these advances, how does it help the OEMs? Now, the benefits are, I guess, fairly obvious to some of you, but I will briefly state them. The benefits will be that from an OEM's perspective, you will see a reduction in time for calibration. Uh, you will see a reduction in cost. And you will also see a reduction in the complexity of the processes that you have for engine calibration. And the improvements that we bring are the quality of calibration, better accuracy of calibration, better fuel efficiency, and faster time to market. So this, I hope, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, helps all of us in the automotive industry to give a bit more positive feeling about the future uh, of the automotive industry. The things that we have achieved uh, up till now in the area of uh, engine calibration, we would not have achieved uh, without the very close and supportive collaboration of our partners at Mazda. So I really wanted to acknowledge uh, their contribution uh, in, in helping us. And uh, I look forward uh, to opening the floor to questions and uh, also uh, uh, briefly mentioning uh, that uh, my uh, uh, colleague here, um, Mr. Tomo uh, Inoue, who uh, is also uh, starting to work with us uh, full time uh, in the beginning of next year. Uh, as our country manager in Japan. So there's a lot of commitment from our side and our company to expanding our business in Japan. So over to questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Visha. Uh, I thought we would expect several questions from audience, but there is no question. So let me ask several questions you know, to, to clarify the the company and the project. So now you have introduced the Mazda has, has used the second mine technology for the engine calibration. And you, you also explain engine calibration has the multiple dimension, probably up to eight dimensions. Does engine calibration include 
optimization of engine's mechanical design, like a shape of combustion chamber, etc. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what the engine elaboration, uh, engine calibration is? Yeah, so our focus in terms of engine uh, calibration is uh, purely to focus on the engine ECU. So uh, again, uh, we provide uh, the models for the engine, the, the engine ECU, and of course, uh, using the parameters and the models that we develop, uh, you know, any company could uh, use that to improve their uh, design or take the input as a part of their uh, design process, but that's purely from their perspective. We as a company don't provide that input into the design process. Good, 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 yep. But uh, so, well, at the same time, you know, I see internal combustion engine that will be banned in China or some European com countries in the future. And probably overall investment of uh, IC development is going to shrink. Uh, Daimler announced that they are going to stop developing IC engine. And uh, well, yeah, well, why does second mind target to those potentially shrinking the market? I think it's a very good question. And uh, there are two parts to it. I think first of all, uh, uh, at least uh, based on the studies that we are seeing, that there will be at least half uh, the engines in the world that are sold could be internal combustion engines for the next 20 years. Hmm. But you're absolutely right to say it is also a market that's uh, you know going down. So one of uh, our goals was that the engines that are being sold, they should be as efficient as possible. The second goal that we had as a company was to build a product that is not limited to internal combustion engines. It is really a very general purpose uh, a calibration technology. Uh, we were very lucky that Mazda was kind enough to try it out. Uh, so we just tried our internal combustion engine as a starting point, but it should uh, help to improve the calibration of a hybrid engine, of a hydrogen engine, of a battery electric engine uh, and beyond. And the key thing to remember is that the more complex the engine, the bigger the benefit you should see from the second mind software platform. So, with the of the problem, then it should be more beneficial. Okay, yeah, yeah. And sorry, one more point I want to mention is the technology is not just limited to the calibration of the internal combustion engines. Hmm. Uh, the vision that we have going forward uh, the calibration of transmissions, the calibration of the. Because I think one important thing to realize is that there's this other trend we are seeing in automotive is the move towards one HPC to control the entire uh, car. And I think so that again, you're talking about a higher and higher dimensionality of calibration. And so we are really targeted strategically to address those issues. Right. So it's not just an internal combustion engine, but you, you know, the second mind is also targeting to electrification, like EVs and et cetera. That's good. Yeah, interesting. Do, do second mind work with other OEM other than Mazda currently? So at this time, we cannot share that information. Uh, with Mazda, of course, they are our strategic partners and we work with them very closely. And uh, But we are we are always in uh, discussions with multiple OEMs. No. Okay, that, that's fair, that's fair, right. And, and yeah, so you just announced a uh, uh, you know, new establishment of a Japan office. But uh, at yeah. the same time, under this you know, COVID-19 situation, so the international travel is restricted and a lot of manufacturing companies are saving their R&D budget. So do you expect growth of international business now? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we had a very uh, interesting situation in the company that really we started to go commercial at the beginning of the year. So we really have made all our Kind of revenues at COVID time. And the reason why uh, our partners and companies are working with us, that especially in the times like COVID, where there is a lot of pressure to reduce the operating costs uh, in, in companies, 
what we have been able to show that we are able to substantially lower the costs of development uh, of our customers. So if uh, there is an issue, and I think everybody is in the mode of uh, cash preservation, then we see ourselves a very useful partner and a trusted partner. And we are very convinced uh, with all the proof that we have till date that we will be able to lower the costs of OEM uh, towards product development. Good, good, yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks for introducing the second mind and its successful implementation at the Matsuda. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much. Shibayama san, have you received any questions? You know, if you haven't received, you know, yeah, we, we can finish our session now. え、了解いたしました。じゃあ、こちらの方も内容なので、えっと、これでおしまいということでよろしいでしょうか。では、シャトラス様、ビデオ、ビデオ、ビデオ、ビデオ、ビデオ、ビデオ、ビデオ、